Hi everyone. My name is Ashley Williams. I am co-president of Black Law Students Association here at Stanford. And we're excited to welcome, welcome you all to our panel. I'm just going to say something really brief about how this panel kind of got started, and then I'm going to turn it over to Professor Polanski. And Professor Polanski is going to introduce Professor Lopez to us, and they're going to have a conversation. So the events in um, Ferguson this summer impacted me, obviously. And I remember scrolling through the Facebook news feed on my phone and seeing Harvard Black Law Students Association had participated in the Hands Up, Don't Shoot um, photography campaign. And I remember screenshotting this and texting this picture to my co-president, Clifford, um, on the spot. I was like, we need to do something like this. Like, the point of bald stuff is to be a voice um, about the relationship between people of color and the law. All right? So Clifford and I talked about it, talked about it. We eventually decided that we wanted to do something like this. I don't know if, how many of you all saw, but we put together a collage of many members of Black Law Students Association at Stanford with their hands up and participating in the Hands Up, Don't Shoot campaign. Clifford also wrote a beautiful statement about our commenting on our perspective on the events in Ferguson. So we put this out there. Diane Chen, we got a great response. I was so glad we put it out there. Diane Chen emailed us back and said, we're interested in putting on a three-part series on the relationship between persons of color and law enforcement. And would Balsa be interested? And we said yes. Um, and so this is the beginning of this three-part series. So this is the first event. And ideally, a three-part series on the relationship between persons of color and law enforcement. The first one focusing on the history. The second one focusing on kind of like where we are today. And the third one focusing on what are some steps moving forward. All right. I had heard nothing but amazing things about Professor Skolansky, including from some of his students and uh, Dean McGill herself. And so I felt like he would be a great person to lead us through this very, very um, difficult, harrowing subject. So I reached out to him, and he was more than happy to um, help us out. So I'll turn it over to him. Um, thank you, Ashley. I want to thank Ashley and Clifford and Kari, uh, Ashley's co-president at Stanford Balsa, for organizing this panel. And I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, there's uh, no bigger problem in criminal justice or policing than the problem of race. And um, you can't think sensibly about race in the United States without thinking about criminal justice and policing. So we have a lot to talk about. Um, and I'm particularly happy to be sharing uh, the floor today with my friend and former colleague uh, Ian Haney Lopez. As um, some of you know, I'm sure, Ian is one of the nation's leading scholars of the forms and dimensions of racism in the modern United States, both inside and outside of law and legal institutions. Um, when uh, Ashton and Clifford suggested that we put together this panel, my first uh, suggestion was, let's try to get Ian Haney Lopez. Uh, I knew that if Ian was here, it'd be a worthwhile hour, no, no matter who else was speaking. We're going to test whether that's true, because I'm going to talk after that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm confident you'll be doing your time as well spent as, as, as long as um, Ian speaks first. So what we're going to do is Ian's going to talk for 15 or 20 minutes, and then I'll say some things, and then we're going to try to leave at least 20 minutes at the end for questions, comments, and discussion. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Amy Wilkins. Great. Thank you, David. Thank you, Ashley. Um, so I'm really coming at this as a scholar of race, um, though I think you can't be a serious scholar of race without, in the United States without focusing in, on how that manifests in the criminal justice system. And, and, and likewise, I think uh, you can't be a serious scholar of the criminal justice system without thinking about race. And, and David's view, so he's coming at it as a criminal law scholar who's published on race. I'm a sort of race person who's published some on crim law. Um, what I want to do today is I want to set the groundwork, in a sense, for Michelle Alexander's address. Um, how many of you have read The New Jim Crow? Terrific, terrific. Okay, so all the rest of you should read it as well. I mean, it's really an amazing book. Um, it tells a history about how mass incarceration arose that I want to generalize. Uh, but then on the other hand, I think, um, you know, with all due respect to Michelle, uh, how race works is under-theorized in that book. So I want to give you sort of a, 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 a more general history of mass incarceration. I want to connect it up to mass deportation. And then I want to talk about uh, six different types of racism uh, and then post-racialism. So that's the 
So, so that's what I want to try and do. Okay, so, so this, this story, um, the story is really one of the role of race in politics. Um, uh, in the South, um, uh, race was central to how politics, the, the, the Southern Democratic Party was organized. It was organized expressly through the 30s, 40s, 50s, through language that was quite explicit about the racial dimensions of uh, segregation and exclusion. The civil rights movement challenges that, that explicit racial exclusion, challenges the segregation, but also challenges the language. It's no longer acceptable by the 1960s to say, this is the white man's party, uh, which was common in the 40s and 50s. Um, now some other language needs to be used. At the same time, the civil rights movement is making a tremendous moral demand on the country, uh, and these civil rights activists seem like heroes in the sense that they are willing to risk jail, risk prison, risk beating uh, uh, in pursuit of an ideal with which all Americans can identify e equality of treatment, um, or at least which many ident Americans can identify. Responding to these two forces, the need for a new language in which to express uh, a, a sort of solidarity with whites and also responding to the moral authority being claimed by civil rights workers, the South in particular begins to shift to a new language. It's a language of criminality. And it begins to talk about African Americans in general and civil rights workers in particular as lawbreakers. Right? And it uses this language uh, as code when it starts to talk about crime and law breaking, uh, unrest, uh, uh, danger. It's a way of triggering fears about African Americans, right? So it's suggesting a solidarity, a political solidarity among whites, and yet it's inoculated against critique because it doesn't expressly say African American, it simply says criminal, criminal, criminal elements. Um, at the same time, by describing civil rights activists as lawbreakers, as scoff laws, it strips their moral authority. This is the sort of rhetorical shift that happens in the South in the 1960s. It's nationalized in the early 1970s by Richard Nixon. So what happens here is during the 1960s, um, there's a sense that the Republican Party can use Racial, race as a wedge issue to break the New Deal coalition. Um, that's African Americans, white working class, uh, Northeast uh, elite. It's not clear that that's gonna work until about 1970, at which point it becomes clear, and, and Richard Nixon takes this strategy and he nationalizes it. And it's, it's called the Southern strategy, but, but in a sense that's a misnomer. Yes, it comes out of the South, but it's gonna be nationalized. Uh, Richard Nixon using this strategy is going to win 70% of the white vote uh, all across the country. Right? What does Nixon do? He adopts the rhetoric of crime and he begins to talk to the population about how he represents uh, law and order and he's going to crack down on crime and people are going to be safe in the streets and it's the silent majority who needs to be protected. And the civil rights, uh, the ba most basic civil right is the right to be secure, right? And you see him hijacking the civil rights language and flipping it right on his head and allowing whites to say to themselves, that's right, it's we who are imperiled, it's our civil rights that matter. Um, these people who are, who are protesting in the streets um, they don't have the moral high ground, they're the threat to us. Um, so part of his crime, uh, partly he uses the language also of, of uh, stalling integration. He starts to talk about how this, the federal government needs to scale back its imposition on uh, local school boards, which is code for allowing the South to resist integration. He starts to talk about opposition to forced busing. Um, in the outside of the South, forced busing is the analog to slowing federal intervention because forced busing, the objection wasn't busing. People have been putting their kids on buses forever. The objection was to the integration that was achieved through mandatory busing, right? So, so he's using all of these code terms. He wins big. Um, uh, so in this process, you're getting now a campaign for votes that's built on appealing to a sort of tough on crime uh, ethos where tough on crime is code for crackdown against minorities. 
Nixon did very well with this, but and, and you see a shift from the late 60s and the early 70s in terms of more and more money. Actually, you see an inverse relationship. In Congress, support for civil rights declines, and legislation and funding for increased crime control measures increases. You also see for the first time the federal government becoming very actively involved in local crime control, right? Because this is this isn't something the federal government is supposed to be doing anyway. But if the federal government, if, if you have federal politicians who are campaigning saying they're tough on crime, they got to do something. Right? Um, Reagan starts to amplify this. He declares a war on drugs. Perversely, at the very moment that he ramps up enforcement against drugs, he also slashes health funding uh, uh, for for drug treatment. Right? And so, but he uses this rhetoric of a war on drugs. He also does something crucial. He begins to tell a story about how minorities are a threat and government keeps coddling them through welfare and also refusing to protect whites by being lax on crime. The power of this story is not only to racialize African Americans, it's also to racialize whites, that to create a sort of racial white imagery in, as central to American politics. It's the white person as hardworking, as law-abiding, as more likely to be a victim of crime than a perpetrator of crime, um, uh, uh, as a taxpayer, um, as somebody who plays by the rules but who's nevertheless struggling, and who is victimized, again, by minorities, but also, crucially, by government. Because it's government that's taking money from whites to give to minorities in the form of welfare. It's government that coddles minorities in terms of a lack of criminal justice system, or I might say, Reagan also made a big point of demonizing all of the war and court procedures uh, that, that protected criminal defendants, saying this is part of how minorities are coddled. There's more rights uh, for criminals than there are for victims, right? The sort of victims' rights movement that, that comes out of this era. Okay. Um, uh, I'm going to come back to crime control in just a second, but, but I want you to understand this is a much bigger story because what happens as Reagan demonizes not just minorities but government is he convinces people that government is a threat in their lives and that they ought to rein in government. And how does he propose reigning in government? He proposes tax cuts and what he calls deregulation. So in terms of tax cuts, the Reagan administration enacts a series of tax cuts that over the 1980s transfer a trillion dollars of wealth to the top 1% of the country. Right? A trillion dollars of wealth to the top 1%. And so how many of you have seen Robert Reich's Inequality for All? Not nearly enough. You need to, you need to watch Inequality for All. It's, it's really striking. And what Reich shows is that we have rising inequality, the top 1% coming to control a quarter of the wealth of the country by, the, by 1927, 1928, right? The roaring 20s, the, the, the very richest have seized control of government, financial collapse, inequality begins to decrease, Great Depression, inequality decreases, it hits a low in 1970, plateaus through the 1970s, Ronald Reagan 1980, it starts to rise again. By now, 2014, we are seeing levels of wealth inequality we haven't seen since 1927. Right? The top 1% of the population control a quarter of the wealth of the country. The six heirs to Walmart control $90 billion, which is as much wealth as 30% of all Americans. How did that happen? It starts in 1980 with Reagan telling a story that says to white voters, fear minorities, distrust government, cut taxes, right, defund government, essentially, and also Reagan uses the term deregulation, but you, you probably recognize a phrase, get government out of the way of business. That's another way of saying, write, rewrite the regulations in a way that favors big business. Right? So through tax cuts, through re-regulation that favors business, um, and then you get financial fraud and the savings and loan industry collapses and you get a Great Depression. I don't know if you, there's a pattern there, but okay, that's a, that's a, that's not right. This great shift in wealth and this great sort of um, a tidal shift where we go from a country that strongly supports the New Deal and an activist government that, that builds the middle class to a tremendous level of resentment and hostility toward government and a surging wealth inequality at the same time that essentially 
uh, the middle class is losing wealth. So from 2007 to 2012, the median wealth in the United States, median wealth, declined by 40%. Right? I mean, we've got a, a catastrophe in terms of what's happening in terms of wealth distribution so the, at the very top and also at the bottom. All of this, I want to suggest, is rooted in culture war politics that tells principally white voters, fear government, uh, fear these minorities, fear women, fear abortion, fear, you know, to buy more guns, fear assaults on Christianity, a culture war politics that, that tells white voters, don't worry about the increasing power of the very rich, uh, uh, not only over the economy, but over government, right? And this is, so this is where we are now politically. Mass incarceration is part of this story, right? And it, and it, and it really starts with Reagan, okay. How did Democrats respond? Starting in 1970, they understood that race was going to be used, could be used effectively as a wedge issue against them. So starting in 1970, they decided they would bail out on race. They would stop talking about it, and they would distance themselves from minorities. Right? So this starts already by the government who wanted to try and put distance between the Democratic Party uh, uh, and minorities. The person who really perfects this is Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton isn't just going to avoid minorities. He's actually going to compete with Republicans in his ability to dog whistle. So he campaigns, for example, promising to crack down on crime using Reagan's theme. He campaigns promising to end welfare as we know, and sorry, end welfare as we know it was a phrase that he used when he signed the law. He campaigns saying, I'm gonna end welfare as a way of life. Well, what was the imagery? Whose way of life was it to be on welfare, right? This is this racial imagery that Reagan had been using. Clinton adopts it. Um, and what you see is massive cuts to, to uh, social safety net under Clinton, and also a massive expansion of the of what was a war on drugs becomes a war on crime. And mass incarceration accelerates under Clinton sort of far beyond what Reagan had achieved. Right? So, so the Democrats and the Republicans, starting by the 1990s, they are competing with each other to show who's tougher on crime. And it's an upward bidding war, three strikes, um, uh, uh, life without parole, all of these, you know, a, a, a dramatic expansion in which crimes qualify for the death penalty, all of this happens because you have politicians competing that they're tougher on crime. But crime is serving here as a proxy language for minorities. Right? Who's going to be tougher on blacks and browns? Who's going to do more to, to protect the, the sort of putative white middle class. That's what politicians are competing on. That's how we get mass incarceration. I want to suggest um, it's also how we get mass deportation. Right? Um, part of the reform that Clinton enacts is uh, expanding uh, the, the number of offenses that qualify as a deportable offense, expanding the number of folks who are deported. There's a drive not just to deport people, but to start to incarcerate them. Um, uh, we focus a lot on mass incarceration. We should be clear that right now we're in a sustained period of deportation greater than we as a country have ever seen. We've never, right now, uh, uh, the Obama administration, Obama administration is deporting over 400,000 people a year. Over 430,000 people are in federal prison today <coughs> on immigration offenses. In fact, immigration offenses account for almost half of the people sentenced to federal prison in 2012. Right? We, we, this, this sense of federal government is going to protect you white, good white folks against blacks and browns, it metastasized into a mass incarceration, but also mass deportation. Okay. But how does race work here, right? This is the story um, uh, that, that Michelle Alexander tells and tells very effectively in terms of mass incarceration. How does race work here? Um, uh, let me tell this in terms of what I'm going to call six racisms. And it's just it's so incredibly important that we understand that there are multiple forms of racism. And of course there are. Right? Race is a complex sociological phenomenon. We are a race stratified society. We have been for centuries. It would be absurd to think that there's only one form of racism, um, as, for example, the conservative justices suggest any protection. Right? This whole idea that racism takes one form and that form is malice, that's absurd. But I want to say it's actually not just absurd, it's a conservative strategy. It's a strategy to say racism takes only one form and that it must be malice. 
because it allows you to deny that everything else is racism. Okay, so the first racism I want to identify is malice or bigotry, sort of conscious animus. Um, did that play a role in terms of Southern strategy or what I call dog whistle politics? And by the way, my own plug here, I've got a book out called Dog Whistle Politics. So if you want the sort of version of this uh, argument in book form, there it is. Um, uh, did it play a role? Um, uh, I want to answer that in a, in a way that's a little flip. I want to say, who cares? Who cares? It's just the wrong question. And, and what I mean by that is, when people talk about politicians strategically using race to, to uh, gin up support, to win votes, to demonize government, um, usually the main defense is, these people are racist, right? So people have criticized Ronald Reagan, and then his defenders have turned around and said, Ronald Reagan didn't have a racist bone in his body. Or, I don't know if you remember, Paul Ryan in the, uh, in the early summer said, um, uh, in order to address poverty in the United States, we have to address a tailspin of culture in our inner cities. Right? A tailspin of culture in our inner cities. And Maxine Waters, uh, I'm sorry, not Maxine, uh, Barbara Lee uh, um, uh, from up in Berkeley said, we know what you're talking about. You're, you're saying black. You know, you're using code. Um, and Paul Ryan said, I don't have a racist bone in my body. Right? I'm not a bigot. Now, um, and apparently, I guess x-rays can tell you whether you do have a racist bone or not. So he approved, right? No racist bone. Okay, so, but that's the, that's the defense. The defense is these people are bigots. And I want to say, I, I don't care, right? I mean, we know, for example, Richard Nixon, yeah, he was a terrible bigot because he taped himself saying really bigoted things. That's not the main point. The main point is what you, what you have is a strategy, a, a, a decision to use race baiting, right? So, one form of racism is, is bigotry. Does it play a role? Well, you play some role, but, but that's not the main dynamic here. It's best not to focus on it. Second terms of racism, second form of racism, unconscious racism. This is one that you're probably familiar with. This is the current reigning sort of liberal response to the idea that racism must be conscious and must be take the form of malice. Then liberals retort, no, it can also be unconscious. Um, and so, great, I, you know, the theory of unconscious racism is very important. It says, look, um, human cognition works in a way that we uh, automatically categorize others. Uh, we do it very rapidly. We do it unconsciously. We have categorized others before we recognize that we've done so. And because of the categorization, we begin to assign um, um, meanings and stories to human behavior, right? That, uh, we tend to um, uh, credit uh, success on the part of those we like. We tend to diminish success on the part of those we view as others, um, uh, on and on and on. Very important insight into how bias works. If you haven't taken the implicit association test, yet, so implicit association test, you can just Google IAT, uh, it's on the Harvard website, it allows you, it's a very clever test, it allows you to, to evaluate sort of your latent adoption of stereotypes, basically that equate white with good and black with bad. So if you haven't taken that, great, you should. Okay. Um, the limitation of unconscious bias, this, uh, the limitation of, of, uh, of, of this sort of theory, there are two. One is that implicit bias sort of says it's just out there. Um, everybody's got it. And so it's racism without racist. Nobody's to blame. Um, and I want to say, you know, we're telling a story in which people are purposefully manipulation ra manipulating racial anxiety. There are people to blame. I blame Richard Nixon. I blame uh, Ronald Reagan. I blame Bill Clinton. Um, the idea of unconscious bias doesn't get us to understanding who these politicians are and what their thought process was, right? So that's one limitation. The other limitation is that much of the work on unconscious bias operates as if we're hardwired to make racial distinctions. And that's just wrong. It's just false and it's dangerously wrong. We are hardwired to make categorical distinctions. Right? I think that that's right. I think biologically, the human brain is hardwired to, to quickly, unconsciously make categorical distinctions. But the nature of those categories, that's culture. That's not biology. It's not biology that says that people are divided between races. It's culture. It's social practices. Right. So, so this is the next form of racism. 
I would talk about, we need to think about cultural racism. By cultural racism, I mean socially constructed systems of meaning that um, elevate some uh, and denigrate others, right? And we should understand that cultural racism um, needs to be constantly reinvented. A culture is vibrant, culture is alive, culture isn't stagnant or static. It needs to be constantly reinvented. And one of the ways cultural racism, cultural systems of meaning are, are, are reinvented are through our politicians. These are our leaders. They have some of the biggest megaphones. Think about Ronald Reagan, for example. Um, one of the things that Ronald Reagan does is he, he uh, uh, really demonizes undocumented immigrants. When he starts to talk about undocumented immigrants, there's something like 3% of the population is worried about them. When he's done, it's upwards of 40 or 50. Right? These, these politicians have some of the loudest megaphones in our society, and they're telling stories about threatening minorities. Right? This is part of what's keeping the cultural knowledge behind race um, not just alive, but it's constantly reinventing it. Okay. Um, uh, next kind of racism I want to talk about is structural racism. Uh, when I say structural racism, I mean I mean driving from Palo Alto to East Palo Alto. I mean what the, what the societies of our structures look like. Um, uh, it's important to focus on structural racism partly because structural racism simply reproduces inequities from one generation to the next. If you grow up on this campus, or if you grow up in East Palo Alto, your life chances are dramatically different. Right? And, so, and that's usually the way in which we talk about structural racism. Structural racism as a force for perpetuating inequality into the future. In fact, Rich Ford on the faculty here is a great article. He wrote it a couple decades ago on, uh, with this sort of a story of structural racism. I want to tell another story about structural racism. Structural racism is how race remains vibrant in culturally in a society in which most people aren't talking expressly about race. And, and so what I mean by this uh, is, is something like this. As you drive from Palo Alto to East Palo Alto, trying hard not to think about race, trying hard not to talk about race, you're nevertheless being bombarded with racial messages. And the racial messages are white people work hard, they're smart, they take care of the environment, everything is neat and manicured, beautiful, peaceful, law-abiding, safe. Uh-oh, look at how people of color live. They're poor. They're on the street. Some of them are homeless. There's trash. The buildings, the paint is peeling. The cars are junk. Many people of color don't work hard, aren't smart, um, have the wrong values, have dysfunctional cultures, right? And you're getting those messages from what our society looks like. And you can't help but get those messages. And in fact, to dislodge those messages, you need to do a tremendous amount of work, right? You need to understand and study and problematize the old, your own privilege here in Palo Alto. You need to understand the way in which disadvantage has been institutionalized through a 19th century, 20th century, a new deal that was limited uh, um, primarily to helping whites, right? There's a tremendous amount of work that's required for you to defeat the messages that the structures of our society tell us on an everyday basis because they seem to be buttressing common sense ideas, common sense cultural stereotypes. Whites are hardworking and smart, law-abiding. Blacks and browns are lazy, deceitful, dangerous, criminal lawbreakers. Right? These things are constantly reaffirmed because of the structural way, the way in which our society is structured. Okay, so structural racism. Next racism, institutional racism. Many people use institutional racism as a synonym for structural racism, so don't be surprised if you see it that way. I actually mean something quite different. How does racism work um, uh, in institutionalized settings? That is, settings in which people go through routines, settings in which they, you work with a cohort, um, settings in which a local culture develops. And you could think about law school. Local cultures develop within law school. You could also think about police departments. They develop through sort of a bureaucratized form um, uh, structures, routines, scripts. These scripts operate at the intersection of sort of cognitive theory and structure in the sense that 
ways of behaving become normalized and become legitimate, and they're so powerful, they provide, they, they have such a powerful influence on how people think, that people will <coughs> adopt ways of knowing or believing, even that run, that run contrary to obvious facts. Right? There's a very powerful cognitive dynamic of how being in an institutionalized, bureaucratized, regularized setting shapes your thinking, right? And we want, and it's important to understand this as institutional racism, the, the paths and scripts that develop within bureaucracies, that helps us understand how prejudice um, can survive. Well, actually, let me put, let me put this in, in, in more concrete terms. I wrote a long article uh, on, called Institutional Racism on this that ostensibly looks at bias among judges in East LA in the, in the late 1960s, but was in fact the piece I wrote coming up for tenure as I struggled to describe how so many of my colleagues could be such decent people individually, and all of them but one or two Democrats, right? They're all, you know, decent, well-meaning folks. And yet there was a period, this was before David was there, there was a period where over several years we interviewed, as faculty candidates, 25 white men in a row. And it took years to get to that number. And when one of my colleagues said, we need to think about what we're doing in our interviewing. She was shunned and ostracized. And I couldn't, but I knew that these people were well-meaning. I knew that they were decent. So how could these decent, well-meaning people be engaged in a process that produced such blatantly discriminatory outcomes, and then when called to think about it, turn so viciously on the person who asked them to think about the right? And so, so I ended up, this, this is institutional racism. It's a, it's a bit, Excuse me, very important. And I think this is, what happened, this is what happened in police departments too. It's not that police are, are, are necessarily, uh, some of them are, but relatively few are, are sort of these vicious bigots as the way they are sometimes portrayed. It's that you get a culture and a bureaucracy and a set of routines that can be very powerful in shaping what people, not just how they behave, but what they come to know is true, right? what they come to believe. Okay, so that's number five. Number six. This is a term you haven't heard before, um, unless you've read my book, which, by the way, I've written a book. Too. <laughs> um, uh, strategic racism. Strategic racism. And what I mean by strategic racism is the purposeful effort to manipulate race in pursuit of some other objective. Right? So purposeful uh, 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 decision to manipulate race in pursuit of some other objective. Um, uh, what I have in mind here is, for example, this dog with the politics, manipulating racial anxiety to convince people to vote Republican, to convince people that government is a threat in their lives. Um, but you can generalize this. In fact, you can understand race, its, racism itself as originating in strategic racism. Right? It is a strategic decision to racialize unfree labor. Right? When, you know, it, 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 the sort of um, uh, uh, 16th century in the United States, um, uh, or 1600s, I should say, unfree labor does not have a racial caste. It is racialized. It is made to apply to blacks um, in a way that justifies unfree labor across generations through a racial narrative. That is a strategic manipulation of racial ideas in pursuit of a labor exploitation over uh, this class of individuals. You can understand it too, strategic racism, in terms of what happens with Native Americans. There is a manipulation of the idea of who Native Americans are that is used to justify expropriation and genocide. Same thing with Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny is a story of Anglo-Saxon supremacy told during the 1850s, 1860s, 1840s through 1860s, to justify a war against Mexico that takes the northern half of Mexico. These are racial ideas, but it's not about race. It's not hatred of blacks, or hatred of Indians, or hatred of Mexicans that's driving this. It's hatred of those groups that's being created to justify, um, essentially, a seizure of control, of resources, of power, right? of labor exploitation. That's strategic racism. We don't talk about strategic racism nearly enough it's incredibly important because it says some people are intentionally manipulating race to win power. And, and we should understand those folks haven't gone away. Indeed, just to make this really current, then I'm going to talk about post-racialism. Um, what do you think is happening with, all, with, with 
conservatives across the spectrum, from sort of really sort of um, the, the fringe Phyllis Schlafly types to moderate Republicans like Scott Brown, Democratic candidate for, for Senate in New Hampshire, talking about ISIS and Ebola on the southern border. And it's key, on the southern border, right? Now, if you want to talk about ISIS and Ebola, please do. I would, I would welcome much more conversation because these are, these are terrible humanitarian crises in the Middle East and in West Africa. The domestic threat is virtually nil. Um, and I don't know, can you be much, much less than virtually nil in terms of the possibility of ISIS or Ebola swimming across the Rio Grande? Uh, there's like negative, I mean, it's just like, it's, it's crazy to suggest that that's gonna happen. And yet, that permeates conservative discourse over the last three weeks, and it will for the next couple of weeks. Why? Because it's time fear of Muslims to fear of disease, and disease we should understand, disease exists as its own sort of panic, but it's also a panic that's deeply tied to race, because there's this old racial calumny that says certain racial groups are spread pestilence. It was applied to the Chinese. In fact, the first immigration laws that we have tried to keep out the Chinese in part by describing them as threats to public health, right? So, and then um, Phyllis Schlafly said that she really did, that the most outrageous thing Obama has ever done was letting in those undocumented children this summer because they were diseased individuals who were spreading disease to our people. Right? So disease on its own, but also disease connected to race. Um, and the southern border, the southern, it's, it, I mean, Scott Brown is in New Hampshire, right? Sort of it, right up there with Canada, or you can think about LaGuardia and planes coming in there, but instead he's pointing at the southern border. Why? Because he wants to connect up this fear with a moral panic about uh, the increasing presence of Latinos in this country. Like, this is, and these are politicians, and what I mean by that is they are careful wordsmiths. They are poets of this poisonous language. They think long and hard about the words and the phrases they use. I don't have a doubt that they understand the racial resonance of saying absurdities like Ebola is poised to cross the southern border, right? Or ISIS is in Ciudad Juarez and is coming to get us, right? This is things that politicians have been saying. People are being strategically racist now. And Democrats are likely to lose control of the Senate and Republicans are probably gonna increase their hold on the House of Representatives in large part because of these sort of culture war provocations, primary among them race. Last set of comments, post-racialism. How are Democrats responding? <coughs> Clinton emulated dog whistle politics. Um, uh, uh, Obama's trying to avoid it. And he's trying to avoid it by saying, by adopting what I would call post-racialism. So post-racialism says, <coughs> I understand race is, still, oh, race is still a problem. But I also understand that if I talk about race openly, I'm going to get slammed for playing the race card. So I'm just going to avoid race. Um, and by avoiding race, I might actually be able to do more for communities of color. Because if I avoid race, maybe I can get through some universal solutions. Uh, and these are actually going to be better for, for minorities than if I try race-targeted solutions, right? And so this is the rhetoric that Obama was really quite open about. For example, in saying to African-American leaders, I'm not your president, I'm the president of all Americans. I can't do anything for African-Americans. I have to do stuff for all Americans, right? He, you know, he, this is what he's saying. This is a version of post-racialism. What has that meant? It fails to recognize that liberalism itself public education, public unions, welfare, infrastructure, progressive taxation, all of those have already been racialized. Even public health. Think about what's happened with public health. Public health is this amazing triumph in the sense of getting, well, something less than 30 million, but, but 30 million or so people insurance. It's an amazing triumph. And yet, most of the public is hostile towards this public health reform. And a lot of them are hostile because of the way it has been depicted as Obamacare, in a way that triggers a racial association with a black president. Um, but if that's too subtle, then you have people like Bill O'Reilly saying, health care reform is really reparations to blacks. Right? Liberal programs have already been racialized. And so what you're able to achieve through universal solutions is actually a minimal to the extent that you avoid taking on how race is being used to divide 
to, to, to sort of divide us politically. Okay, that's the first cost. The second cost is Obama's decided to avoid race, right? He's decided to avoid race. So in June, he gave this, this uh, I won't read you this whole quote, but in June he promised that he would do something about um, uh, mass deportation and about undocumented immigrants, 11 million undocumented immigrants in that country. Um, uh, uh, last month he said, no, I'm not going to do anything until after the midterms. And it's pretty clear why he's not going to do anything until after the midterms. It's because he's worried that um, uh, it won't make a big enough difference in terms of boosting the number of Latinos who vote for Senate candidates, but on the other hand, uh, immigration reform will boost the, the, the sort of Republican base that comes out to vote, right? And it's sort of this clear political calculus covered both the New York Times, Washington Post. This is what Obama's doing. But think of the human cost. So Obama every year has deported more people than George Bush ever deported. Um, 2013 was the highest level of deportation ever in this country. By delaying reform from September to after the election, assuming he can get it done when he's a lame duck, which I don't know. That's another 60,000 people deported. Right? There's a tremendous human toll that's being taken by the sort of post-racialism um, that refuses to engage with how race is actually shaping our politics. And so this is where I'll, I'll end. Um, this isn't going, we aren't going to solve any of this if we, um, uh, 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 if we keep hiding from race, if we keep running from race. Race is central to mass deportation, race is central to mass incarceration, race is central to Ferguson in terms of the politics that, come, that, 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 um, um, that created that aggressive policing also in terms of the way in which Ferguson, Missouri um, has very low taxes, but raises, I think, a quarter of its revenue through the criminal justice system. Right? All of this is this sort of racial politics. So uh, Ian comes at policing because he wants to think uh, about race, and if you think about race in this country, you have to think about police. I, I come about, I come to policing the communities of color because I'm a scholar of criminal justice, and you can't think about criminal justice or policing without thinking about race. So what I want to take about five minutes to discuss is why uh, so many people, even on the left, even among progressives, find it hard to think straight about the history of policing communities of color in this country. And I think there are two reasons. Um, one is that uh, it's two stories, but it's really one story. And the other reason is everything's changed and nothing's changed. So first let me talk about the two stories that are really one story. So the two stories are over-policing and under-policing, or um, the occupying army and the ghettoization of crime. So the first story is the more familiar. Um, you know, uh, five years before Michael Brown was shot in Ferguson, Oscar Grant was shot at the Fruitvale Station. Um, Ten years before Oscar Grant was shot at the Fruitvale Station, Amadou Diallo was brutally sodomized in New York. Um, two years before that, uh, Admiral Luima was shot to death in New York. Um, it was half a decade before that that Rodney King was beat um, in Los Angeles. It was two decades before that that Fred Hampton was murdered in Chicago. It was another two decades before that that uh, the Groveland boys were shot point blank in Florida. Um, and that just takes us back to the meaning years of Jim Crow. Um, and um, what, all, what this drumbeat of headlines suggests is, is borne out by statistics. Um, members of racial minorities, particularly blacks and Latinos, are stopped by the police more often, they're frisked more often, their homes and their cars are searched more often and more violently. They are uh, subjected to SWAT raids more often. They are shot more often, they're arrested and convicted more often, and incarcerated more often. Um, and this history uh, of disproportionate impact of criminal justice on members of racial minorities uh, is very long. It's particularly uh, gruesome um, in the South. Um, how many of you have read Devil in the Road, Gilbert Eaton's new book? So you can put this on your nightstand next to uh, the new, new Jim Crow and um, DVD of Inequality for All. It, it, it's a story about Thurgood Marshall's uh, participation in the criminal prosecution uh, of um, four uh, young black men in uh, Florida 
uh, for a rate they didn't commit, um, and a lot more. Um, and it's just a slice of the history that uh, includes Bull Connor and the fire hosing of civil rights demonstrators. Um, the, the, the history of the civil rights movement is, is thoroughly interwoven with uh, the history of criminal justice. Um, police were front and center um, in the images of brutality against African Americans that were broadcast throughout the country during the 1960s. Um, uh, inequities in the criminal justice system were a large part of what fueled uh, the civil rights movement, and they're a large part, uh, and, and police, and, and brutal, stupid responses by the police to the civil rights movement were part of what uh, accelerated that movement. Um, so, uh, as I said, this is a particularly uh, striking story in the South, but it's not at all limited uh, to the South. Um, when, uh, in, in the aftermath of the urban riots in 1967, when President Johnson appointed a white elite commission led by Governor Otto Kerner to figure out how this could happen, that communities across the United States went up in flames, the Kerner Commission uh, issued a report a year later. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with uh, the opening paragraph of the report. That's the report that said, our nation is moving towards two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. But uh, what few of you probably know is that the report then went on to describe and to rank in order of importance the grievances that led to uh, uh, rioting among urban communities throughout the United States um, in the in, in summer of 1967. And at the very top of that list uh, was police practices. And that was a wake-up call uh, for some people, but it uh, shouldn't have been a wake-up call. I mean, it was, uh, James Baldwin wrote in 1960 that the policeman moves through Harlem like an occupying soldier in a bitterly hostile country which is precisely what and where he is. Um, so, that's one, that's one story. That's the more familiar story. That's the story of over policing. It's the story of, you know, that there's, a, there's a scholar of policing who says that the police are to government as the edges to the knife. And there's a long history of that edge being pointed mainly at the throats of blacks and brown people in this country. Um, the other story is the story of under-policing. Uh, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment was aimed in large part at ensuring that African Americans would receive legal protection against private violence at the hands of whites. The Supreme Court quickly gutted that uh, from uh, the 14th Amendment so that it wouldn't do that work. Um, and there is a long history of, uh, uh, of white society turning its back on criminal activity in minority areas and allowing it to continue there. Some of you may remember uh, the line that Don Salucci uh, has in the first Godfather movie when the mob is talking about whether they should go into uh, <coughs> drug marketing. And he, uh, he says, it's fine as long as we keep it in minority areas. And the line, it's a chilling line. He says, they're animals anyway. Let them lose their souls. So that's a line that resonated with minority audiences. Godfather because it captured a sense not only about how the mob operated, but about how government operated. Um, uh, drug markets, prostitution <coughs> markets were long tolerated, have long been tolerated in minority areas. There's a long history of uh, violence against black and brown people not being treated as seriously. Um, in, uh, in the 1990s, back before the LAPD became the new LAPD, back when it was the bad old LAPD, there was a ballot initiative in Los Angeles to increase funding so that we could hire more police officers. And it, it received a strong majority of votes throughout South Central and throughout, uh, the, uh, and, all, uh, and throughout the east side of Los Angeles. It was defeated by white voters on the west side who didn't want to pay for more policing. They didn't need it because they had private security guards. So I say that these are two stories, and they're often treated as two stories. It's often treated as though if, if the problem is that blacks and, and, and browns don't have enough police protection, then we don't need to worry about police brutality in minority communities. But they're not two stories. They're one story. It's a story of minority communities. It's a story of policing of minority communities for the benefit of and protection of white communities. Um, that's one reason why I think uh, there, it, sometimes it's hard for people to think straight about the history 
of policing communities of color in the, in the United States. The other reason is everything's changed and nothing's changed, which is to say the story here is a story of partial and important but radically incomplete progress. So we've moved over the last several decades from a situation where police departments throughout the United States were overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly male, and thoroughly and very self-consciously racist um, to a situation where in most major cities, police departments are quite diverse. In many major cities, um, minorities are no longer underrepresented on police departments. There's been a change not only in the numerical makeup of police forces, but also in the culture within police departments. That's hugely important. Uh, civilian oversight has become unexceptional throughout the United States. Uh, in police. Shootings up by police officers, the civilians have gone down. In many, many ways, policing is way better than it used to be, and it's way, be it's, it's way better for minority communities in many ways. But in lots of areas, police departments look the same as they looked 30 years ago. That's true in Ferguson. It's, lots of, it's true in lots of communities, particularly smaller communities throughout the United States. It's still true that um, in many places, um, uh, police forces don't look at all like the communities that they police. It's also true that even departments that have become thoroughly integrated uh, still tend to use force more often uh, uh, against members of racial minorities, still tend to underprotect minority communities, and that's partly because uh, of the, of the multi-stranded nature of racism that uh, Professor Haney Lopez was discussing. It's also true that in some ways things have gotten worse. Police departments have gotten more militarized over the last uh, 20 years, and minority communities have borne the brunt of that. Um, order maintenance policing of the kind uh, that was pioneered in uh, New York have swept many more members of racial minorities, particularly young black men, into the criminal justice system. Um, and um, crim immigration has merged uh, policing of crime with policing of undocumented migrants um, in a way that um, has, has led to um, the criminal uh, migrant be, uh, becoming, the, in many ways, a new face of illegality um, uh, in, in, in U.S. politics. Um, so, um, it, it's easy for us to think about a story of slow but good progress. We're getting there. That's a story we know. It's easy for us to think about a story of everything's changed the same, everything's just the same, nothing changed. We know that story. It's harder, I think, for us to think straight about a story where lots changed, lots of good things have happened, um, but uh, we're nowhere near uh, so I said we would save 20 minutes uh, for discussion, and we didn't do that. Um, but I, I sort of feel I, I feel like we can't just stop. So I think maybe, uh, even though I'm actually supposed to be somewhere else right at this moment, <laughs> uh, I, I think I'd like to at least have five minutes uh, of comments, and, and then we can all. Mm -hmm. So do you have anything to say? What's the order of maintenance, please? Order maintenance policing is, is, is sometimes it's called zero tolerance. Sometimes it's called broken windows. Okay. So the idea is that um, if you um, it, 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 if you allow disorder to go unchecked, it breeds more serious crime and violence. Uh, and uh, so uh, what we'll do is so so the, the story was in New York and many other cities, particularly in New York, we're going to start making sure that people act civilly. And we're going to not tolerate small acts of incivility, like turnstile jumping, like you know, peddling of small amounts of marijuana. Uh, we're we're going to crack down on all of that. Um, uh, the, the problem is that, that that was never what New York did. It was never what any city did. They were always quite selective about what kinds of disorder they cracked down on. Um, and they were selective in ways that were racially scripted. Um, so, the, the effect of uh, broken windows policing in New York was to sweep into the criminal justice system hu a hugely increased percentage of uh, minority youth, particularly young black men. Um, I was wondering if either of you have read 
I, I'm you know familiar with the, the racial reaction story, the Southern strategy story, and how it turns into the war on drugs. And the <coughs> scholar who just wrote this book, in which he, you know, I bought the book, I haven't read it yet. So. <laughs> I was just and, and I started reading it, and I, I was, I couldn't quite. Um, what she, my overarching claim, if you're interested, in, she says, is there, that lawmakers constructed the civil rights carceral state in which liberal notions of racial violence and agendas for race neutral machinery propelled development of a punitive carceral state. Crime politics were at once symptomatic and uniquely structuring of post-war racial liberalism as efforts to govern a racially explosive society, ultimately affirmed the sensibility that only the proceduralist rights-based state could diffuse what racially threatened the nation. In this sense, crime policy and carceral expansion were not reactions against civil rights. They were the progeny of civil rights as lawmakers had find them. So I don't quite know what to make of that. And I haven't read the book. And now no one's read the book. And I just, <laughs> I'm sorry. But it seemed like she was trying to get at some kind of undermining or further exploring how Democrats and people who are reputedly liberal contributed to the development of that racial reaction. And so that ended up being a comment, not a question. I'm sorry. But a good comment. <laughs> All right, well, um, I know you all have other panels to get to, so I want to thank you for coming, and thank you for your attention, and we would all work to do it, and we need to do it. Exactly.